Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm here with uh, Assembled Media, uh, Simon Anderson, live from outside Auckland Central Police Station in, uh, I guess, just on the border of the Central City and West Auckland. Uh, Andrew Costa, the Police Commissioner, uh, is joined by Mark Mitchell, the Minister of Police today, to tell us all about the, um, the new anti-gang law enforcement initiative. Um, so, hopefully, I'll be able to get in and uh, and uh, and film it live for all of you. All right, uh, I had a, I had a few problems. I couldn't get my streaming software to work properly, which is a little bit annoying. So I'm just I'm just using the Twitter app. Uh, so things aren't quite as cool as they normally are. Um, the other thing is I'm not 360 filming. I'm just recording uh, flat and broadcasting portrait. Uh, I've, I do have my 360 camera in my pocket, um, but uh, but uh, I'm not using it. I don't think uh, I don't think I'm going to need it. All right, fair bit of media interest today. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. So the announcement was scheduled for 11 o'clock. I see it's about 11:05 now, um, and uh, and Andrew Costa is expecting to take um, questions from the media at, uh, at 11.15. So, going to join the media scrum and uh, see what happens. But uh, yeah, it's really interesting with the media. Um, obviously they all know one another. Um, and it uh, seems they use opportunities like this to have a bit of a catch up and, uh, you know, a little bit of industry gossip and all that sort of good stuff. So please do bear with me. Um, uh, I don't know what's going on. As I say, the scheduled announcement is quite late. Um, uh, Minister of Police Mark Mitchell entered the building probably, I don't know, seven or eight minutes ago. Uh, so I'm sure something will happen soon. But yeah, please do bear with me until that happens. Uh, I hope you're hearing the audio nice and clear. Um, I've got two microphones running. Um, one uh, label mic that I'm wearing and a mic which is in front of my camera so hopefully the audio is going to be okay. Right, uh, I might give you a bit of a look around. This is the Central Police Complex. It's actually um, it's fairly well located on the border of uh, the Central City in West Auckland uh, and it's, uh, it's a nice building. I can see I've got a few people tuning in now. Uh, for those that are just catching up, um, this is Andrew Costa's uh, announcement about gang law enforcement, uh, the new initiative that, uh, that uh, he's going to detail now for the assembled media. Um, it was scheduled to happen at 11 o'clock, and it seems that everything's running a few minutes late. Uh, my understanding was that the briefing was to occur inside the building. Uh, that's what uh, the police media team told me when I asked. Um, but uh, so far it's locked and uh, we're just waiting for, uh, for something to happen for either Andrew Costa to, and Mike Mitchell to come out to address the media or for all of us, I guess, to file in. All right, so that's the status of things right now. And I'm afraid that, I'm sorry, all that I can show you at the moment is the front of the building and the assembled media. In terms of my equipment, I'm not recording 360 today. I've just got a handheld, um, which is recording uh, in portrait on my secondary phone. Or rather, it's it's um, recording in landscape for later use, and um, I'm broadcasting to you live in portrait, as I always have to do with Twitter. Uh, something went wrong with with my streaming software Prism. I couldn't get that to work properly, so I'm just streaming live with a Twitter application. Uh, which is a bit annoying because it means I can't put my watermarks and bits and pieces on it. Um, and I really wanted to uh, because Jack Harris had created me uh, a really cool lower third that I wanted to use. Uh, all right, so look, um, please do bear with me, everyone. Uh, as soon as um, as soon as uh, something happens, 
goodness, I'll let you know. Well, I guess you'll just see. to talk about well i guess i'll show you my camera while i'm well there's nothing much else to happen here's my this is what my 360 camera looks like um, and as i say i don't think i'm going to need it today so i've just got it in my pocket and i haven't got um any i haven't got my normal really long selfie stick i've just got the one i'm holding that's got the my my two phones attached to it but i think they they seem to do pretty well these like uh, pretty good for streaming and um and for recording All right, so it'll be really interesting to hear what questions the media asks uh, after this. I'd be really interested to know if um, this new gang enforcement uh, um, program is going to take away uh, valuable police resources from tier one priorities, like, like protecting rainbow pedestrian crossings. Uh, but you never know, maybe I'll get the opportunity to, to ask, maybe I won't. Oh, looks like here we go. And let's see if uh, they let me in too. Hopefully they do. Here we go. Have you got um, a pass on? I don't know. Sorry, you won't be able to come in. Oh, okay. Well, I talked to the media team earlier. They didn't think it would be an issue with... Uh... Uh, if you can sign in, if you've got some oh, okay. uh, identification and credentials with Frank Counter. Okay. Through, How, this way? Yeah, All right. Thanks, there. Jack. Yep. Okay, so I hope you saw all of that. I need to provide identification and get a, a visitor's pass, <coughs> which is fair enough. In terms of the type of our demand, we know that gang members commit a disproportionate amount of crime and harm in New Zealand. Particularly in the areas of serious assault, robberies, drugs and firearms offences and homicides. Police has been working hard to combat the impact of gangs and organised crime in recent times through national and targeted district operations, through our organised crime investigations, offender prevention teams and many other responses. You will have seen us focus hard on the policing of gang events to protect and reassure the public. Today I'm announcing the establishment of a national gang unit and district gang disruption units to target crime, harm and intimidation caused by gangs. I've directed that the national gang unit be established to enable a continuation of our work and build our operation capability further. The unit will work with police districts across the country, drawing on the successes of Operation Cobalt and other coordinated responses to gang funerals and other gang activity. The National Gang Unit will support district-based staff to plan, coordinate around enforcement and police responses in a determined effort to continue applying pressure on gangs and to prevent gang-related crime disorder and intimidation. Incoming legislation will provide police with new tools to respond to the harm caused by gangs and will help ensure communities feel safe. The National Gang Unit will ensure our officers can effectively enforce the intent of the legislation. To further our frontline capability, we'll also be investing in new gang disruption units. These will be dedicated district teams to help identify, target and catch priority offenders and maintain the focused view of the gang environment. Today's announcement signals the start of the process to establish these frontline gang disruption units. Resourcing allocations will be determined through this process in consultation with district commanders and is likely to include a mix of reprioritised and new investment. 
Placing gangs in serious offenders is an all of police priority. The new gang units will boost our focus and capability, but they're not working alone. Our whole front line is involved in preventing the crime and harm caused by methamphetamine, organised crime and gangs, whether through road policing, organised crime investigations, prosecutions or prevention activity. At a time in the world when safety and feeling safe is an evolving picture in many countries, New Zealand is still one of the safest places to live. But the changing gang landscape means that police will continue to adapt to tackle these challenges head on. Ultimately, it's about supporting our front line to ensure everyone is safe and feels safe. We want to deliver the best results for our communities. Work to implement the National Gang Unit is currently underway. Once complete, the work of Operation Cobalt will be continued through the National Gang Unit. I thank the Minister for joining us here today and just invite him to make a couple of comments. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. Uh, look, thanks everyone for coming out this morning. This is an important announcement. Um, this is delivering on what is our government's priority around putting public safety now at the heart of what we're doing and clamping down on a serious gang problem that we have in New Zealand. We also recently um, the tragedy that unfolded on Ponsby Road with a um, killer these gang member carrying a firearm and, uh, and killing an innocent uh, member of the public. Uh, we're not putting up with that anymore. And uh, we've got a big program as the incoming government around public safety. This is part of it on the operational side. Of course, we're giving the police additional powers. We've got a, we're banning gang patches. We've been very clear about that. The only reason why uh, gang members wear gang patches is because they want to frighten and intimidate the communities that they operate in. And by the way, to avert the right to wear a gang patch, they have to have shown they've got a propensity to commit violent and sexual crimes. And there is a trail of tears and sorrow sitting behind each one of those um, gang patches. So we put a line on the sand and we say that's no longer tolerable for us in our country in New Zealand. We're giving them um, dispersal notices so that the gangs actually won't be able to gather in numbers. We're giving them non-consorting orders so gang members can't work with each other to organise their next nefarious uh, activities. We've taken those powers from Western Australia where they've been very, very effective in disrupting uh, uh, gangs and where the gangs are actually, and there was a, there was a um, I was recently in Canberra with, um, with Paul Papalia and the Commissioner um, Cole Blanche. There was an article that was running on the front page of the paper saying that the leader of the rebels gang was leaving the gang because it had just come too hard. And we want gang members to leave the gangs. And we'll actually help them, especially those with families, to actually come and rejoin society in a positive way. But we want to send out a very clear message. If you continue to um, uh, uh, peddle um, drugs, if you continue to perpetrate violent sexual offending um, in our community, if you continue to break the law and think you're above the law, then under this government things are going to change radically. And I want to acknowledge the Commissioner and I want to acknowledge the announcement today because these um, gang disruption units that are going to be based in the districts um, supported by the gang unit um, centrally are going to be very effective in making sure that if a gang member or a gang pops their head above the parapet, then the police are going to have a strong response um, to deal with that. So look, I'll wrap it up there and, um, and we'll go out to um, any questions that uh, you might have for us. Minister, can you tell us how much is this going to cost and how many people are we thinking of, of being in these units both regionally and at the national level? And how much is it going to cost and how many people? Okay, so I'll just cover the cost but then I'll go to the Commission on the operational side of it. So we've been very clear that we will continue to invest uh, in our police and we've been very clear that we want resources on the front line. So, um, but a lot of that is budget sensitive, and you have to wait for the budget announcement um, at the end of this month. Um, but we've been very clear, and the Minister of Finance has been very clear, that we are going to continue to uh, make a substantial investment into police, and that includes an additional fr um, 500 uh, frontline police officers. So, you expect this to be a budget priority in terms of cost? Well, you, like I said to you, you'll have to wait until the budget, um, which is the end of this month, to see how that has actually been, how it's been put together in terms of where the prioritisation of this is going. So what exactly will these new powers be? Well, are you talking about the powers that, we that are in front of Parliament at the moment? Well, banning gang patches and, and gang insignia. So it means that gang members no longer will be able to wear gang patches or gang insignia in public. By the way, um, I, I took the law through Parliament in 2013. It was a members bill by Todd McClay and it banned gang patches in schools and hospitals and public buildings. And, um, and it's been effective. So what we're doing is we're just extending this to all public spaces. Dispersal notices, which will give the police the ability to be able to break up 
large gathering of gang members, they'll have to leave that place or any other designated place. They won't be able to return or come together within um, seven days. So can we just go to staff? Sorry, oh, sorry, yes, but so they always go through the courts or so, do those so, orders to with the police in the first instance? How will they work? So, so all of that legislation is currently before the Slip Committee, um, so they are dealing with that and that detail. Um, some of the orders will go through the courts, others the police will be able to have the ability to actually apply that um, order themselves immediately, um, verbally. Commissioner, how many staff are going to be in these units? And you talked about reprioritising and moving people. So what kinds are less important that you take the staff from here? The announcement today is the start of an engagement process with our teams and districts, so I'm not going to go into uh, fine detail on this, but this will be a mix of reprioritisation and potentially new investment subject to budget decisions. So uh, what, we percentage, envisage, what percentage of reprioritisation? Um, uh, I, I suspect we'll end up with about 50-50 mix across this whole model, but um, we need to see where those conversations get to. Uh, we will be looking particularly at uh, how our intelligence is focused to ensure that we're able to collect the right information we need on uh, gangs locally. Uh, and we have a range of groups uh, working across different investigative prevention response priorities that we will be able to consider for contribution in a very focused way on gangs. If you're taking 50% of their staff from other operations, are they doing work that's not important at the moment? Uh, there's always opportunity to reprioritise and we've been uh, very clear about the need for us to refocus onto core policing priorities. Uh, police has become very spread across a wide range of prevention functions. Uh, some of those functions can properly be argued are not the domain of police to deal with. So we will be uh, so looking... So you're doing stuff at the moment that's wasting your time? Not wasting our time, but that uh, can really be said to be the role of other uh, agencies. That's like mental health products. That's one of the areas that we've called out where we are responding significantly uh, to crises that don't require at least intervention. But we didn't build gap for those mental health products. Well, clearly there are others whose core responsibility matters and we are engaged in those conversations presently. Um, but police is not the right resource to be providing um, Response to mental health crisis where there's no physical threat to safety. That, 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 just, just really quickly, that question that's an ongoing piece of work um, as the government because police have had to deal with a 60% increase in mental health call outs. Often you'll have a, um, a, a two person police uh, patrol tied up at the Auckland um, emergency department and to look after someone that might have, that actually needs to have a proper mental health response, and someone that's trying to do that, that is not the best use of police time. Police want to be out here on their core role. And so as government, we're discussing in terms of how we can rebuild the task force. And actually, we've just announced an initiative where we're going to put um, peer support people into some EDs and hospitals around the country to give the police the, the relief and to be able to do a seamless transition and get back um, on, their, on their core role. Which I think is what the public expect as well. Commissioner, can you explain to me how this gang unit would have prevented the fatal shooting on Constable Road? One of the opportunities that sits in front of us with new powers coming through is to have a much stronger focus on gangs and harm they cause. Gangs are an entity or entities that give rise to all sorts of harm. Uh, they do that because of the business they do, they do that because of the way they intimidate people in communities. Uh, and the momentum that sits around gangs uh, is all tied up in that identity and their presence in communities. So uh, when we are able to get a better handle on the gang landscape and police that using new tools, then we will see an overall reduction in that harm. Is this, sorry, sorry, is this, is this institutionalising cobalt? Um, cobalt was only around for a, certain, I mean, for a certain amount of time. Do you see this as using all those things you've learnt out of cobalt? Is that what is happening? Yeah, that's absolutely part of this. So the very deliberate policing approach that we brought through that operation has enabled us to have a very strong enforcement focus on gangs. Uh, and so we will envisage that we're continuing under the banner of this unit. Um, but it's also about ensuring that in every district we have a very good handle on gang activity and we're able to get ahead of it to deploy proactively, not just using the staff involved in these groups, but a whole person as well. Just go back to what Lisa said about what happened in Ponsonby. That guy was sort of public, he wasn't wearing a Philippines insignia when he committed, you know, when what, you know, that shooting happened. He was uncashed, he yes. had a concealed weapon in a bag. What about this unit in any way would stop that incident yes. happening? So we, we know that gangs are linked to 8% of violence, to 18% of serious violence. Uh, 
Uh, and so a very high proportion of the harm that's done in communities happens because we have a group of people who are associating in a particular way, who are uh, promoting offending in a particular way, uh, who, because they are patched, intimidate members of the public, it stops witnesses coming forward. Uh, and so the entire um, function of the gang is enabling criminal activity. And when we get a better handle on the gangs themselves, uh, we, we use the tool of a patch bag to be able to reduce their presence, that reduces their ability to intimidate, uh, and that will see gains across the board. So you're you aiming to make gang membership um, less, less popular? You Absolutely. Want it to be, okay, so if there's about 9,000 gang members at the moment, what sh what's your target? This unit is going to reduce gang membership by how many? Okay, we will know we've been successful when we see reduced gang visibility in communities, and when we see what are your measurable targets? When we measure? see a reduction in harm from uh, gangs, so that those you have in the pack we've provided to you uh, some numbers that show the immense uh, contribution that gangs make to harm in our communities. We would want to see all of that go on. I'm not going to. I'm not going to say to you, I'm after exactly this number because we will know we've made a difference when we feel it in our communities. So what are your measurable targets for this unit? Can you just give me your top two? We have not set targets for this unit except for effective implementation of this gang legislation. So how uh, and we will know it's worked when we see a reduction in harm from gangs in our communities. We can measure that. We can measure the extent to which gangs are involved in uh, various crime types. We've given you the data for that. Uh, when we see all of those numbers go down, we know we're on the right track. Um, this is not an overnight fix. Uh, but this is an area of focus for us and we will make that. Oh, sorry, 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 just to Lisa just raised a couple of points. This one made a couple of points in the knowledge that we don't want the public being exposed to gang patches and gang insignia. We want it gone. The police have got very good intelligence networks. They know who they're dealing with. They know who the gang members are. They don't need gang patches to, um, to signal or let them know that. Our fire is prohibition law that's currently in front of the uh, select committee. We're giving the police additional um, warrantless search powers. They will go a long way to be able to stop gang members and search them, search their vehicles, and take firearms off them. They'll be a very effective um, additional tools for the police. And by the way, the police have been very effective in the last six months. If you think about towns like the Pokey or Coromandel town being overtaken by gangs, when you consider just about every week you have headline in the media about convoys, gang convoys, driving onto incoming traffic, taking over um, intersections, abusing and intimidating uh, members of the public. You haven't seen that in the last six months because the police have had a very strong response. They've been putting resources yesterday, in. Minister? Uh, yesterday, Minister? How many officers yesterday, were involved yesterday was, there was four arrests? Ye yes, yesterday was extremely successful. I was down in that community yesterday and the feedback was positive because the police had the resources there and they policed that event properly. But there was and a lot of gang they, they, they prioritised actions there. How would you deal because with that? Because our gang patches ban has come into place here. But how would you deal with that if, if that happened after that war? Do you expect police, and it's why they have put that list because they have to enforce these new powers, how do you take a, physically take a gang patch off of these? And do you expect police so to be more Our staff have got discretion about how many they do enforcement. We don't always have to win at the time, but we will win in the end. And so if people come out and breach, if people come and breach the gang patch ban, and we can't deal with it in the moment, then they can expect that we'll be knocking on their door uh, with a search warrant to uh, recover that patch in due course. So that, that's the kind of tactic that we can use. Um, in the end, police have a job to do here. When the law passes, we will enforce it. Uh, but our people have discretion and we were expecting them to be Sorry, just just on that question, I do want to respond to that. At the moment, our frontline police officers, their job is more dangerous because gangs think that they run the place. Gangs think that they've got control of the streets. The best way to make public safe and our police safer is to actually enforce the law and make and, and, and um, make the gangs understand that they're not above the law. That they have to respect the police. Isn't that they don't get to treat the rights of the public. Lives put them more in danger. No, uh, me, me personally, um, me personally, no, I don't. And I'll tell you why, because the commissioner made a very good point. It's regardless of what legislation is in place, police have always had the discretion as to when they use that um, that legislation. That has not changed. 
and they, they will base their decisions around staff safety and how they implement it. But I think that it's going to, without a doubt, we've got a world-class police service that's got deep capability and will be, without a doubt, is able to actually implement rules that we're passing. So with that in mind, what's your message to people who see these measures that you're trying to put out there but still feel unsafe in that community and that's the problem? Well, that, that's a genuine feeling. Um, we are completely sensitive to that. And that's why, we turn, that's why, as an incoming government, we've got a massive program around public safety. We're putting victims back at the centre of our criminal justice system. We've just made a, announced a $1.9 billion into our correction system to build capacity, more staff, pay them, and also a big focus on rehabilitation. So they've got a good chance of reintegration, and actually that has got a contribution towards public safety as well. So the Commissioner has just made a very good announcement today showing intent in terms of what we want to do to get on top of the gang problem in New Zealand. And that is what we're doing. Is this similar to... Sorry, is this just... Can just hear that from you as well? Just what's your message to people? The physical presence of gangs in our communities leads to significant fear. And this is not isolated to particular parts of our community. Uh, I have had the opportunity to engage with communities right across this country. And what I consistently hear is that the presence of gangs makes people feel fearful. The patch sits right at the heart of that, and so we welcome the opportunity to make a difference in terms of uh, those people to say. And so you said you want to roll it out as soon as possible. Do you have a rough timeline? How soon can people see this unit in action? The national unit will be stood up by 1 July, uh, and the district units will, will stand up in the months following between then and when the legislation comes into effect. So, what, uh, district it's relative. what district? I envisage that uh, almost certainly every district will have a team, uh, but we will be looking at where the demand sits, and our geography means that um, the solution might be a bit different in a very spread geographical district than the one that is uh, less so. So, we're working through the details of that, but you can expect that this will be uh, the kind of capability that exists right across the country. Uh, focused Sorry. on where the game comes. You said in 2021, but you have to be careful not to be fixated on gang things because 90% of the people that you're arresting, targeting, high criminal acts, like record number of drugs and stuff, um, we're not gang for the you know, they're not going around wearing gang patches. Um, so we're not going to stop going after organised crime and the people who distribute drugs in our communities. There is significant overlap between organised crime and gangs, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the thing about gangs is the fear that they create uh, and the environment that they foster for drugs to be distributed at the street level in communities. Do you think so, anything's changed between that time, 2021 and now? Uh, we have got a very clear priority from the current government about a focus on gangs and we've been given new tools uh, that we are going to use to achieve that outcome. Uh, in the end, you know, gang membership is not an offence. Shortly wearing a patch will be. That's a great opportunity for police to make a record. Would you say this is similar to Strike Force, uh, Raptor and New South Wales, which National has been trying to push for years? I hope so, because Strike Force Raptor in Australia is very popular uh, with the communities over there. That normally when the gangs um, start to break out in gang warfare, the communities immediately ask to have Strike Force Raptor uh, it's, come it's also really they, they, they solely um, focus on, on gang harm and gang offending and organised crime. Um, I, I think coming back to the question, it was a very good question, is quite simply um, the, the, the Commissioner is responding to um, the priorities of the government of the day. And there is a new government, and we've been very clear about the fact that we're putting victims at the heart of our criminal justice system, and that we want now not to suppress and start getting stuck into organised criminal groups, gang, and the violence that they perpetrate in our country. And we want to get on top of the violence and crime. Uh, so, Minister, did you instruct the Commissioner to? Yeah. Well, have you, have you read my letter of intent that I released publicly to the commission? It was, it was, it was very clear. No, I, I, he, that is operation. That has been his decision uh, and his decision alone. And, um, and that uh, operational uh, independence is very important. But in my letter of intent, I was very clear. It is the incoming government, victims of the heart of our criminal justice system, public safety is number one. Uh, law abiding citizens will have their rights protected over and above those gangs that want to break the law and think they're above the law. And we want to see actions taken in a positive way to, stay there, to start here on top of a problem that has grown out of control 
over the last six years. I'm just just the the number of I just wanted to get some people an opportunity to have one year. Yeah, I'm just for the Commissioner. In terms of prevention, depending on who you ask across political spectrums, across policing, it will look quite different. So, what is your definition of prevention for that? Uh, so, within the Policing Act, one of our statutory functions is crime prevention. That's a very broad statement. You can construct that quite narrowly, you can construct it pretty broadly. We have had a pretty broad frame on that in recent years, and that has seen us spread very thinly. So what we're in the process of doing is drawing that back in. Uh, it's not to say uh, the prevention's unimportant, it remains a key function of ours and we will continue to do it, uh, but you will see police focused on the things that are more uniquely what police can do, uh, and looking to others in the community to do the broader and, and in, terms of, in terms of resource allocation, um, are you worried about conflicting interests for the police? Obviously we've seen um, major crime rising within Auckland, um, we've had multiple different issues, as well as this gang unit now. A lot of gangs are centred heavily in the regions, away from major cities. Are you concerned at all about pulling officers away from the major cities to go there? Look, we are quite used to moving staff around to focus on priorities where they sit, and we know that in some parts of the country we will need to um, move support in to enable uh, staff in smaller towns to be able to deal with this issue. That's pretty normal for policing, uh, and we're always balancing a whole range of priorities. What about domestic violence, for example? So 18% of serious crime is gang affiliated. What percentage is domestic violence related? And what have you both doing to combat that? So family violence remains a massive demand for police. It's roughly 20% of our frontline time. Um, we so that's have, more than the 18%. But it's not your top priority. Uh, it is a high priority for us. So when we speak to um, the key focuses for police, safe homes, safe roads, safe communities, um, gangs sit fundamentally in the safe community space, but we can't forget that there's a significant overlap between harm and, fa and family violence and gangs. In fact, uh, you would struggle to find a gang household where family violence is not a feature. Uh, and so by focusing on gangs, we, we actually also impact positively on family violence. Uh, on future youth offending because many of our young people can come from homes like that, uh, future imprisonment, future gang membership. Uh, we will continue to focus on family violence and, and I want to be really clear, when we are um, focusing on court policing, if someone is at risk of violence or experiencing violence, that's very clearly a police job and a police response. Where we are looking for support uh, from others is dealing with family dysfunction where violence is not how Commissioner, how, how, how are they going to be different? I need to. Are they, how are they going to be different from just regular cops on the day? Um, so the, these staff will be selected uh, for the right skills. Um, that will probably be in the areas of intelligence, potential investigations, uh, and in terms of frontline policing. Will they have firearms? Uh, they won't be armed per se, but we do have. Uh, a whole lot of new capability that we haven't had in the past around offender prevention teams who are tactical operators. Uh, they would work alongside the troops, our uh, under offender squad. So we will supplement uh, the, and we will need supplement these teams because they're not going to be big teams. They're providing the nucleus for action, but all of police are needs to support and that will include tactical capability. The one thing I'll say is, is don't underestimate or diminish the, um, the training, the abilities of all our frontline police officers in whatever role they're deployed to. Um, they are world class and, uh, and capable in, in dealing with um, any uh, event that they get thrown at them in their role, everyday roles as a police officer. Just coming back to the question, a very important question around family harm. So um, a cornerstone of our belief um, as a government is social investment. And you would have seen an announcement with um, the Honourable Michael Willis, um, who is heading up our social investment. And that is quite simply in our country, we have got intergenerational harm that we have never been able to really get in and fix, and, uh, and this government has got a big focus on identifying where we can make an investment uh, in these people, in these kids, to make sure they've got the best fighting chance of realising their potential, rather than being on a fast, um, uh, the fast track into the youth justice or the adult justice system. And that's a big piece of work, but the work that the Commissioner and I have to do as, as Minister of Police in support of that is to deal with the hard, crunchy bit and that is just a violent crime that suddenly is, is, is proceeding in our country. Well. So why is this new unit being announced today? On the back of the constitution shooting or just... This has been in planning for months. Uh, so we have known uh, with new legislation coming uh, that we need to be able to set up in the right way to deal with that. So 
uh, that was a, a catalyst that's been on the cards for a long time. Um, there's no particular metric in, in the time of the announcement today. And Commissioner, you talked about how the armed defendant squad would help out and other people would move around there. If we're looking at the core unit, how many people are going to be involved in that? The, the, so we'll have the national unit, yeah. which I envisage will probably draw in resources of about 25 to 30. Uh, we will have district teams. Each team will be about seven people. Uh, the number of teams in their exact placement is what we need to work through in the process we're about to run. Um, but as I say, this is not the response. This is facilitating an aid law, an aid law setting us up for the response. The response is 10,000 officers calling on them for road placing, calling on them for tactical capability, for investigations, whatever might be required. And we know that in um, the early stages of new legislation, we will need to move resources around to support. Commissioner, just on the, on, the, on the time of the there are hundreds of people wearing patches there. You have said you might not intervene in the moment, but you will follow up. And you said, search warrants, you'll go to the house and take your patches. So, in that case, how many patches do you reckon were there yesterday? Uh, look, I, I Hundreds, you would have said? There are certainly hundreds of okay, people. Okay, let's say 300, just, just roughly. So, when you get a search warrant for every single person who was wearing a patch, go to 300 houses and get 300 patches. Is we we will plan? We will enforce this new law. So that is your plan? Is uh, this scenario? We, we, we certainly scenario? will be seeking search warrants uh, in that kind of situation. And what we've seen, uh, if you follow the legislation around gang conflict, it's been hugely effective uh, because as soon as uh, we get the opportunity to go and intervene in that way in somebody's home, we find guns, we find drugs, we find other evidence of criminal offending. And so, uh, if people choose to breach this ban, they will open themselves up uh, to police intervention in a way that will lead to a whole range of other uh, issues for them. So, so you essentially that have the a commitment that you give to the New Zealand public today that you will go and get every one of those patches that you saw yesterday. Look, I'm, I'm not saying for all situations exactly what will happen, but what I'm saying is it's a general principle. If people breach this legislation, they can expect police to follow up. And we will use the tools available. So, so essentially anyone that, so anyone that has a patch, you essentially have the power to go and search their car or the well, house. If the court, if they were in a patch in public, once the law has been passed, that is illegal. Just like it is now, and we're allowed to wear them onto an New Zealand flight, and we're allowed to wear them into a school or a hospital, it's now illegal. And by the way, although they think they're above the law, they're gonna to have to adhere with the law. And if a police officer asks a gang member to remove their patch and they refuse to do that, and the police officer can't enforce it at that time, the police now have got a warrant, they, uh, they're able to use a warrant to go around to the house and seize that patch. Gang members hate having their houses searched for the reason that the uh, commissioner had just outlined. There's normally drugs and all sorts of stuff in there that they don't want to be discovered. So, and Lisa, coming to your point, I just don't accept in this country that we should just wave the white flag and say the gangs are too strong and they're above the law and they're not going to adhere to it, and we shouldn't do it. It's exactly that reason is why we're doing what we're doing, and why we're giving the police the powers to allow them to start to suppress and give the public a sense that our police are controlling the streets and not the So you want everyone of those patches collected the next day? You want everyone of those patches my, collected? My expectation is, is if there's 300 gang members with 300 patches, and the police tell them to remove those patches, and they refuse to do it, then the police will get follow-up action and they will take those pictures. And it'll mean searching their homes. And, and by the way, the police uh, have got a deep capability that everyone seems to be ignoring, and they've already shown that in the last six months in the way that they've been policing these gang convoys, where they've been putting checkpoints in place, they've had the resources there, they've been using Eagle, they've been arresting so people they on warrants. The they why did they need to call it something else, like the National Gang Unit? Why can't you do all of this? Well, then, then again, it's not a racial question for um, the Commissioner, but what he's doing is he's responding to the incoming government's expectations around putting public safety and victims in the heart of our criminal justice system and putting pressure and suppressing and disrupting and creating as much harm or as much disruption as we can to um, these organised um, criminal groups. We, you know, we, we, want to, we want to inflict um, maximum damage to them. And we want them to say in New Zealand that it's just too hard to peddle drugs, perpetrate violence, and be a member of a gang. We, and actually, we're hoping that they might do what just happened in Western Australia 
and just stand up and say, this is all too hard, we're going to find a way that she rejoins society in a positive way. So well, Commissioner, why can't you do it? Why can't you do it now? So, um, if we could just start to wrap up the questions. Oh, we have to sit down at the table, so please get your questions out of the way, but we're very welcome to it. Yeah. So, there are lots of ways for us to organise ourselves, but our experience is that when we have units that are specifically focused on a particular area of crime or harm, uh, that we're able to get much better results. They have a great expertise, um, local knowledge, and then they can enable the rest of the police to how they do that. So this just makes a good sense for us in the um, focus that we're going to have. I think, yeah, yeah, Minister, a strike force Raptor, which you say you want this to be similar to, has been accused of uh, lawful harassment tactics. Is there any way that you're concerned about this, or what will you do to manage that? No, I'm, I'm not saying that this is like strike, strike force Raptor. You, you asked me if, you wanted, if I wanted to have the same effect, and I said yes, um, I do. It's been very effective in Australia in suppressing and disrupting and, um, and, and uh, applying maximum harm to the end. So, and um, this is exactly what we're trying to do over here as well. But are you concerned about a lawful harassment tactic? I'm not concerned at all. We have a world-class police service, and, um, and I fully back them, and they're deeply capable, and I know that they'll do the job that we need, and not, not just as a government, but as a country, um, to get on top of this. And by the way, from my experience, every police officer that joins the police, they do it because they want to serve and protect the community that they're a part of. Minister, there is a response. This is a response to what's happening at the moment, but, you know, preventative measures, what if this community would you be better off like investing in schools and uh, <coughs> youth communities, you know, youth centres, well, churches? Well, I agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a very good point. And, and you're seeing that this government, we're making massive investment into, into education. Um, the Honourable Nicola Lewis is heading up our social investment unit, and that is bringing the whole of government together and identifying where we can make the investments and investment in the Kiwi's life, especially those families with intergenerational harm. Um, where the kids haven't really got a fighting chance. They're probably on a fast track into the youth justice system. Making that investment much earlier to allow them to be um, a part of society with, um, you know, that can sort of take advantage of all the great opportunities that our, that our country offers. So that piece of work, like I said, is the cornerstone of what we're achieving. And in the long run, that's the work that'll make the biggest difference in terms of reducing the amount of people coming into our criminal justice pipeline. But the piece that we're talking about is having to deal with that hard country but that's in front of us right now. And that is uh, unacceptable levels of violent retail crime and totally unacceptable levels of um, gang-related harm uh, violence across this country. And there is a good promise the very last question to the chair for the front row. Oh, um, Minister, if you were talking about the effort that police have done in the last six months to yes. tackle this, why say we're waving the white flag? No, no, I was, I was, I was using that analogy to um, with Lisa because um, the way that she had put the um, question to the commissioner is that and what in the narrative that's been in this country actually since we've been debating this is that the gangs are too strong, um, they're above the law, there's no point in us passing this legislation because they're going to ignore it anyway. And to me, that's waving the white flag. And I'm not prepared to wave the white flag. I love my country as we all do. And I'm not willing to accept the fact that we can have a proliferation of gang members in this country that carry firearms, that are willing to use them and perpetrate an enormous amount of harm. Um, it's completely disproportionate to actually the, the size of, um, of the gangs that we have here. And we've been very clear that we're going to take down on that. And, and victims and public safety are coming back into the heart of what we're doing. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, I, <clears throat> I hope uh, I hope everybody liked that. I thought that was fascinating. That uh, that fifty percent of it is coming from uh, reallocation of resources, and the expectation is fifty percent will be from from uh, new funding. So it'll be interesting to see what that model looks like. I also thought Mark Mitchell did uh, particularly well, saying that uh, that he thought a, a strike force raptor wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. All right. I'm going to end the stream, and uh, hope everyone enjoyed uh, another episode of Simon TV. Talk to you later. Thank you,